episode 23. Let's do this. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Welcome back. I am your host, Enoch Sears, and this is The Business of Architecture, the show for solo architects where each week I bring you an interview exploring how you can leverage your skills as an architect to make more money so you can forget about paying the bills and focus on creating great architecture. Well, welcome back, Agile Architects. I want to welcome you to Business of Architecture today. Today we have the honor and privilege of having Heather Johnston, AIA, with us. She's the principal of Heather Johnston Architects in La Jolla, California. And she has some pretty interesting things we're going to talk about today. She just finished building um, her own custom residence in La Jolla. And so we're going to go through that process of what it took to do that. So first of all, Heather, welcome to the show. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks, Enoch. Good. Well, I've already told our audience a little bit about you, but please tell us a little bit more so we can get to know you personally, and then also tell us about your business. Oh, where would you like me to start? Right at the very beginning? Um, uh, let's see, uh, Canadian by birth. Uh, I was born in Canada, it's very far north, uh, son of a, um, daughter of a fur trader. And, uh, seriously? Real, seriously, Canadiana. Wow. And, uh, and, uh, he was a, my mother was the daughter of a prospector, a gold prospector, an inventor. So I grew up in pretty much um, in the land of the midnight sun with ours being my own and uh, a lot of freedom, tremendous amount of freedom. There's not much up there except for rocks, stubby trees, 100 miles south of the tree line. And um, just a terrific amount of exposure to the outdoors and um, a lot of different cultures, um, the Yellowknife Indians for one. Um, my first friends were, you know, Native Indians and we just grew up in a way I don't think that many kids have the chance to uh, now or even then. So I think that gave me a certain sense of adventure. I mean, yeah, you blow my mind. I mean, I'm just, I'm just imagining the mental picture here of being out there in such a rugged, I have this mental image of what it must be like to, to grow up there. And so then from your childhood on, and coming from that background, tell us, you, you went to school somewhere along the line, you decided to be an architect, or did you first go into another career? Well, my first choice was painting, painting and drawing, and uh, so I studied and got my Bachelor of Fine Arts uh, at the University of Alberta, which is a thousand miles south of where I grew up. Wow, and, a thousand miles. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it was a terrific time um, being in the big city, <laughs> and uh, then uh, I went to Europe to see what the competition was going to be. I wanted to look at the best paintings that had ever been painted and the best sculptures that had ever been made and was completely amazed by the architecture. Um, uh, the paintings just dwindled in comparison. The buildings I was just astounded by and I thought, well, here's a chance to really make an impact. So uh, returning from Europe, um, I joined, uh, I wrote to the first 50 architects in the end of the phone book and uh, got a, a call from a couple and ended up with Bart Myers who's quite well known actually here and in Canada and he happened to be a professor at UCLA. He uh, said this is a school for you young lady and so I ended up at, in Los Angeles for my master's in architecture and um, worked very hard. In school? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me a little bit about your experience at UCLA in the master's program. What was that like? It was a great time to be there, Enoch. They have, uh, you know, Frank Gehry was um, giving studios and Tom Main and Morphosis when they were still a company. And we had Rias Pearson and we had Eric Owen Moss. And so many uh, architects at the time. And this was, uh, I graduated in 87. It was really when a lot of these people were starting to really get their legs. And... Um, I can't tell you just the excitement at the time about architecture and so very, very lucky and I just can't remember much else about Los Angeles except the studio, <laughs> which is crazy because <laughs> it's a very exciting city um, and it's a city too that was right on the cusp of really becoming something that mattered and um, very edgy place and it was just a really great time to be there. Fascinating. I mean, a lot of energy. I can just imagine, you know, having these 
these architects are on the cutting edge of LA, especially down there, you know, around Santa Monica where they're doing, they're just pushing all the bounds. What, how did that relate to the studio and your experience at school? What, um, was UCLA at that time, was it more theoretical? Was it more construction based? Did it have a particular kind of theme to the architectural program? That's a good question, Enoch, and it's very, um, uh, theoretical, I would say. Not so much as SciArc, which I know you've heard about, but um, in more of a practical theoretical way, um, being encouraged to uh, explore things that it would be very unlikely uh, you could have the chance to do once you graduated. Um, I would say we didn't get a lot of grounding in the actual business of architecture, um, which I think uh, is something that all schools need to look a little more closely at, but we were given the opportunity to um, just really explore and actually we were goaded into being more adventuresome and more and take more risks as um, you know many of us went in there very conservative wanting to do you know nice little projects but we were actually kind of kicked out of that kind of attitude and said you know here's your chance and also it is and uh, how many architecture schools does LA have on like four at least so it was quite competitive between them all and we'd go to each other's credits and um, yeah, so it was a great experience because, you know, Cal Poly has a much more practical focus, and then SciArc was much more experimental again, and then there was USC, which was probably somewhere in the middle of all that, and uh, because of that, there was constant lectures, there probably, I know there still is, house tours, of, you know, it's got a great um, history of modernism in LA, mid-century modern, you know, Neutra and Schindler, and, um, you know, it's a fabulous place to study architecture if you're interested in that sort of cutting-edge modern thing. Excellent. You mentioned that at school there was not much of an emphasis or even much note about the business side of architecture. That's what a lot of us architects have found is we went to school to design and you mentioned that you wish in a way that you would have they would have had a little bit more of that in curriculum or maybe there was some room to put more of that in. What what things about the business of architecture do you think would be important for students coming out of school to learn? Well I think it's going to be um important to stress that it's great to think outside of the norm. It's fabulous. One must do that and it has to be encouraged. However, uh, the science of building is what's going to make it happen. So I think it's important to not just stress the science of building but also to talk about um, how are these things going to get funded and what are the options in getting your projects built. Um, at that time in particular, it was very much the star thing, all these uh, wonderful architects that everyone, oh, they're so amazing. Uh, so if you weren't a star, it was sort of like, what's the other option? Well, you were a CAD jockey doing elevators. Um, there wasn't really much of a uh, emphasis given on an alternate way to do architecture other than being a star. So if you weren't a star, it was like, well, then what are you? So I think that maybe that's still being answered uh, at the school. You know, it's been a while, but I think it's definitely something with, that the star system was very much um, glorified and and um, talked about as something that we should all aspire to. And I'm thinking maybe that's a little bit off base, particularly after we've come through these last 10 years and what we've seen. Interesting, interesting. You know, and that is definitely a dialogue that I hear going on. Uh, on social media, architects are talking about it in the, the journals that we hear, the architectural magazines, people are discussing the role of the star architect versus the majority of what architects do. So yourself and where did the career take you? Did you go this did you go to try to be the star architect route? Did you where where did you fall in that continuum? <laughs> well, I must say that um the only reason I was in Los Angeles was to go to architecture school. So weekends were uh Dude, surf's up. <laughs> I was awesome. I forget about it. I'm here to work. And uh, so I had a different attitude. So one would say that is the kind of attitude that is driven by I really wanted to succeed. I wanted. I also had to succeed because uh, I was paying my own way. Um, so if it wasn't for scholarships um, that I managed to get three years in a row, I probably would have had to bail and go work in a restaurant somewhere. So I was very motivated financially to actually continue to excel because that was the only thing that was keeping me in school. Um, so I would say then I graduated with that same idea that ta -da, you just work hard enough and you're going to get noticed and all these people are going to call you up and throw money at you. <laughs> and, um, yeah, that's how I graduated and of course, you know, life gets real. 
Yeah. So did that work out? I mean, how did that did that happen? Um, how did it work out? Well, well did you know you mentioned you know the the idea, and I know you're being tongue in cheek about people throwing money at you and working hard. You know, so what was the reality when you came out that you discovered? The reality was um, eleven dollars an hour working in an office. Can you imagine that with huge student loans, eleven dollars an hour, and uh, my engineering friends were making twice that as a starting salary. Attorneys, doctors, they were like shaking their heads. It's like, what? Um, because I worked so hard, I worked harder than any of them put together. Except, well, maybe doctors. But uh, and then I was asking for uh, a raise to eleven fifty an hour. That's appalling, and I don't think it's changed that much. And I still think that. There's a lot of soul-searching architects need to do about how hard they work during school and, you know, after school and what the rewards are. And to me, that's always been a disconnect. Yeah. You know, you've been in the industry long enough to probably have gathered some conclusions or some hypotheses about the industry. And let's just speculate a little bit, you know, just what do you think, what are your opinion of why that system is the way it is in terms of, um, I don't know if it's a pay disparity or not, but there's definitely the impression that you know, starting architects have a low salary, and then even when they're in the prime of their career, their their salaries don't necessarily compete with uh, the amount of time they put in school regarding um, compared to some other professions. And the so, internship. Exactly. You know, uh, do do you see any core systemic problems with the architecture field that kind of lend to that, or what's your perspective on why why that is? That is such a great question, and I wonder how we actually got ourselves in this position in the first place. And I'd say it probably goes back to. Um, you know, at one point we were master builders and then we kind of lost that because somehow it got dirty to mess with the buildings part portion of the whole um, uh, idea of getting buildings built. And um, as a matter of fact, I think it was quite clear in the uh, 30s and 40s in the AIA, um, uh, whatever they call it, set of rules that uh, you never mixed architecture with the actual construction. And I think that kind of um, separated architects from their previous grand role, deservedly so, of the master builder. And since then, it's been more and more diluted. And as you know, we read, we read the same blogs. Um, a lot of it's uh, architects not wanting to take responsibility because it's gotten so litigious. So they, you know, give a lot of responsibility to contractors, project managers, none of whom are. None who none of whom have architecture as their first uh, architect architecture as their first goal. Uh, so I think I have to say I, I'm afraid architects have to take the responsibility for where things are now because they've you know they've abrogated pretty much you know a lot of the scope to other other parties. So I have to say architects can only look at themselves. Gotcha. Well, it's good to get your thoughts on that, Heather. I appreciate it. The, the, another question I had for you was, so you come in, let's go back to the time, then you came out of school, you went and worked really hard at these firms for $11 an hour for a while, and then take, take me from there to, to give me a summary of, of your career up to the point where you went out on your own. Uh, the summary, well, yeah, I worked for um, a number of bigger firms, Hardy Holtzman, Pfeiffer, and Barton Myers, as I said, and then also Rios Pearson, who do some lovely work in L.A., and then the early 90s hit, 92 when um, it was pretty pretty similar to what we just went through. And so at that time, uh, they were still building in Canada. So I had to say goodbye to L.A. And um, I went back to Canada when, uh, you know, to actually continue to get my chops in how to build. And uh, I was hired by a couple of, um, I call them cowboy architects. And they're called um, Osborne Clark Productions. They're two architects, but... They gave me a tremendous amount of responsibility. It was awesome. They put me in a little float plane. Um, this is in Vancouver, and sent me off to all these little islands to help them build uh, houses for you know people who were retiring or building second or third homes on these little islands from the ground up, clearing the site, uh, getting the materials in by ferry or you know uh, truck or float plane because uh, it's pretty rough there getting all the services brought in. And they would just put me in the float plane, wave goodbye, and say, uh, you go, girl. And I really was given a lot of sink or swim responsibility right from the beginning. And that's, that's where I really learned what it's about. And talking to the builders, you know, 
being comfortable with the guys, let's face it, they're all guys, and enjoying them, having fun, at the same time as being scared to death with all the responsibility, but, um, you know, that was pretty good. And what happened was um, I, I met my husband on one of these, the shortest uh, airplane flight <laughs> in Canada, 13 minutes long. <laughs> And uh, so we ended up getting married and moving to one of these little islands. And the only other architect on that island, Schubert, actually, a, a former student of Frank Lloyd Wright, well, he died. And so there was, hi, I'm an architect and I live here. So I was, it was very fortuitous that I started to get calls from people wanting, you know, second homes from this little island called Salt Spring. It's one of the Gulf Islands, you know, there's Bellingham and uh, Thetis Island in the United States. There's a string it's called the Gulf, Gulf Islands. It's off the coast of Seattle. They extend up into Canada, and it was on one of those that I was able to actually then start to do my own projects and and just see to the pants stuff because you know <laughs> uh, I hadn't really done a lot of that except for other another company. So, and how did people know that you were an architect and to call you? Um, well, first of all, um, it, there's a little paper there, but it's it's a very small island, and the it's one of those places that the population swells during the summer. And then during the winter, winter there's just the locals. Uh, so uh, word got out, I think, because um, uh, well, I started to talk to some builders and say, look, you know, if we could work together, et cetera. And then also um, uh, people had heard of Osborne Clark. That's, these are the people that I, I worked for before I decided to start my own firm on the island. And they checked me out to see if I was, frankly, cheaper. And I was. <laughs> so let's face it, they picked me because I was cheaper. I was certainly untried. So... And you mentioned, too, um, the architecture firm you worked for is Cowboy Architects. What, what did you mean by that? Well, they didn't follow the rules. They were like, eh, they had, a, they had a, first of all, they had like two women working, for, three women working for them. And they um, kind of run a kind of office where we'd kick off on a Friday and then we'd go and, you know, sit at the, um, have, uh, sit on the water and drink beer. Uh, but then we'd, you know, come in on the weekends and work really hard till, say, really late. And, uh they were not a, a um, bow tie and little round glass and white shirt and tie, <laughs> white shirt firm. They were kind of the opposite. They were rugged guys hopping on float planes, uh, tromping around. This. They, they were um, coasties. You know what that means? You know what a coastie is. Yeah, well, someone who's very comfortable um, on the coast and is used, used to that kind of float plane way of getting around and and uh, sitting out around a fire, a fire, a campfire, and um, more of a rough and ready kind of architect than a than a stiff laced, uh, stiff office kind of guy in New York. Completely the opposite, and I loved that. It was very fun. Well, now is a great time to talk about uh, our success quote, Heather. Did you have the opportunity to look up a quote that you'd like to share with our audience? Oh yes, I did. I'll put on my specs. And, we'd, um, love, we'd love to hear that. Uh, yeah. This is kind of perfect. It's like, hell, there are no rules here. We're trying to accomplish something. <laughs> That's from Thomas Edison. Wow, that ties in perfectly with what we were just talking about. So tell me about that. What did that mean to you, and why did you choose to pick that particular quote? Because in the end, you have to follow, I would say, your own rules, and you have to make your own rules. And basically forget about what everyone else is doing because it'll just um, scare you if you start worrying too much about what everyone else and where they are and, and how they function. And it takes a lot of, um, I would say, fortitude but, uh, and self-belief to forge ahead on a path that maybe no one else has ever go, um, you know, fallen before. But I think that's it. Forget about the rules. Well, we know that Thomas Edison was a great innovator, so could you just give us that quote one more time so we could hear it again? Hell, there are no rules here. We've got a project to build. Nice. Have you ever used that on site? Uh, yeah, and it mostly gives a laugh. It kind of lightens things up a little bit, too. Yeah. It's good. It's like, don't take it so seriously. We're just doing stuff here. and. Um... Absolutely. You know, lighten up the mood a little bit. Now, on, on the island, when you started working for yourself and providing architectural services. Give me one or two lessons that you learned from that early time. Um, maybe things that you hadn't realized before or things that help you be successful in the future. I'd say the most important thing I learned um, 
Enoch was uh, working with the people who were building the project. I have such huge respect for everything they do. They work um, so hard, and there's nothing more wonderful to me than a beautiful detail of, say, how you keep the water out, or how you put um, a horizontal up against a vertical in a beautiful way. And the respect I have for these craftspeople who actually do this all the way through to the, um, you know, the guys who are doing the blasting. Uh, it's, to me, um, I just have a huge amount of respect for the people who are actually doing the building. And so I would say my biggest lesson is that uh, you show them that kind of respect and you'll get it back in, in spades. They'll work for you. They'll work overtime. They'll, um, I'm not saying being their friend, uh, but there's a certain respect that's established um, simply from, you know, first of all, you have to have good craftspeople to be able to give them that. But um, that's, that's the important lesson. Here on the show, we're all about learning from our, from our past mistakes and failures. Is there a failure that you can look at that you had that you were able to overcome and then learn from that failure that you can share with us? Yeah, I would say perhaps in this house that we just finished, um, somehow thinking that, well, we're paying them and we've signed a contract and therefore they're going to perform. Uh, I think the biggest mistake I've made is thinking that maybe I don't have to pay as close attention to something as as I really do need to, um, expecting people to always uh, perform. And uh, I think the biggest mistake was just not paying close enough attention. And I learned that you've got to be there every day and you've got to know it better than them uh, because in the end, you're, you're the one paying the bills and you're the one taking responsibility and no one cares like you do. That's the biggest lesson I've learned. So you were up in Canada. And then somehow you, you ended up back down in Southern California. Was there an intermediate place, or how did you end up back in uh, La Jolla? Well, to be honest, Enoch, it rains up there. <laughs> Tell me about it. That's what I, I hear. <laughs> I know. It's, it starts raining in October, and it lets up maybe in, you know, end of March. And it's so depressing, especially if you used to live in L.A. So I pined, and I finally dragged my husband back. And, yeah, I don't know if you can ever return to a place you left, so I don't know if I wanted to do L.A. again. So we checked out San Diego. It's a little more relaxed here. I felt there's a little bit more room. It's so competitive in L.A., which is great, but um, there's just um, a different pace here. So I dragged my husband back here, and um, our, <laughs> we found a place uh, um, in La Jolla, it was the least expensive house, independent place, and it was by uh, Schind Rudolf Schindler, a uh, little place called, um, um, what are they called, the Pueblos. I don't know if you know them from the history books, but they're uh, one of Schindler's first, uh, kind of like a condominium project of concrete slip uh, poor construction, and we bought one of those for 300 and some thousand here in La Jolla. <laughs> we couldn't believe we could afford to live here, so uh, this, uh, by the way, I didn't mention that this entire space was 600 and some square feet. <laughs> wow. So it was uh, interesting. My husband had his office there, and uh, after a while, I had my office there, and uh, it, it was interesting. So. Interesting. That is interesting. So you mentioned your husband had his office there. I'm sure our listeners are curious. Tell us a little bit about your husband. What does he do? Oh, my husband's uh, an engineer. We're completely unaffiliated in terms of business, and he's um, basically he works with... Uh, the big oil companies on ice spills, I um, mean you know, oil spills and oil and ice shipping, uh, oil spill plans, how to clean up oil. And so he uh, spends a lot of time in the computer and mostly traveling. Um, he just got back from Kazakhstan. Um, they're working on ways to do ice cleanup. And yeah, he's got a pretty neat job and it's fun. But I'm the boss of the architecture. Nice. So he's not, he's not tied to location with his job, it sounds. Can he, is he flexible with his location or is he tied to an office? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we can live anywhere, you know, except I'm, I'm a little bit more tied down to where a building happens to be going on. Yeah, okay. Now, since you had already gotten your start up there in Canada, you come down to La Jolla, and you're looking at starting up your architectural practice. What were your immediate steps to try to find work? You know, Enoch, how many times have you heard this? Tell me. I don't I'm know. looking into my little camera, but how many times have you heard this? Uh, I started doing decks and bathroom remodels, and um, I have to be frank. Um, I think that I'm, you know, like anybody, easy enough to talk to and charming enough. There's, that's, our, most architects are, right? We're so charismatic. Um, but people t uh, chose me because I think I was reasonably priced and I wasn't scary. I wasn't some big fancy architect who had been in all the magazines 
and they basically just wanted a deck. They didn't want a star architect. They wanted someone just to get something done. So I don't think anything's changed. I think if, if architects are still, you know, losing out to other people, uh, it's going to be the people who are grass people and people who aren't intimidating. And I think that gets a lot of little jobs uh, done, um, and they're by people who have nothing to do with architecture or the name architect. My very, interesting, very interesting insight. I mean, I know that I'm doing some of those projects right now myself. Yeah. And how did you get your name out there? My neighbor uh, was gave me my first one, and that actually that deck turned into a whole second story and remodel. And um, what else can I say? Always being sort of competitive enough, I guess I wanted to make sure it was photographed right. And I sent it to some magazines, and they sort of took a little bit of interest. And... Uh, so I got that, that one project published and then um, uh, once again just hanging around um, furniture stores that are uh, you know selling interesting furniture and then you get to know the people and then you get invited to their parties and um, make good friends with certain people who then have other people coming into their store who may be looking for architects and that's how I got my next big job which was a ground up after a fire and that really helped too because it turned out um, their neighbor I had met at this particular modern furniture store and we talked and it's just very um, fortuitous and it was never super easy there's piles of stuff that I you know I just you know they never called, called me back so, yeah you know yeah. so that's so it's got to explain that a little bit more to me because right now hanging around a furniture store I'm seeing I'm seeing you standing by the doorway you know kind of hiding it's behind a, a sofa waiting for the next person to come in the store um, how does that work well, actually, uh, you know, we after this little uh, Schindler house, um, we were squished, and it became um, apparent we had to find something really great uh, to move into because, you know, being architecture fans, we found um, a place out in Escondido, which is, um, you know, quite a, quite a ways inland, and uh, but it was built by Homer Delaware, who is a a local architect now, he's not around anymore, he's, he died, but he was a really good mid-century modern guy and we totally loved this house and it was way out in the boonies. So we moved out there and then to furnish this wonderful mid-century modern house, um, we went to this uh, store called Boomerang for Modern and he had all the great stuff and by the name you can tell what kind of great stuff. And um, his name's David Skelly, great guy, and he um, has, has and uh, did have soirees when he invite all the modern fans to, you know, everyone's different house. And so we had a, an evening at that house, uh, the house that we had. And, um, you know, that's how we got to know other like-minded people. Uh, so that's, that kind of helped a lot. And sp particularly for um, San Diego, which isn't uh, known as a hotbed of, you know, modern architecture, um, it's a very small group. So we got to know each other pretty well. Interesting. And how keen is your husband on the modern architecture? Oh, he loves it. Um, I, I met him and he had an egg chair. <laughs> so, Ooh. <laughs> so I know I said, I got to keep this guy. <laughs> an engineer with an egg chair. That sounds interesting. Yeah. We need to have him on the show sometime. He sounds like an interesting <laughs> well, guy. He's right there. Oh, is he? Oh, okay. Tell him I said hi. So now you're you're here and, and you start going from you know decks and you start you're very methodical about how you document your project and how you uh, try to get it published. You know what are the things that you seem to be successful for getting the kind of projects that you want to work on? It sounds like dialing in with that modern group was very instrumental. Yeah, I, it definitely was, Enoch. And I would say what's been instrumental in getting uh, any project I, I've ever won is my enthusiasm and passion. I think it's catchy. And um, I'm not sure how other architects talk, but from what I've heard from the clients that do hire me, it's uh, they talk about square footage and dollars per square foot, and uh, I don't talk about that. I talk about how the light comes in and how you move through the place and where you put your keys when you come in, and I, I love architecture. And I think that probably communicates itself. And naturally, um, I think it probably makes enough people go, mm, no, she's not the right person. We just need some plans. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you as an architect can raise your fees, land the projects you love to work on, and get the time in your day back, 
Join the members only Business of Architecture Insider list for free by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash free. Enter your best email address there and I will send you instant access to free resources including my book, Social Media for Architects. If you'd like to discuss a thought or insight from today's show, visit businessofarchitecture.com slash podcast. On that page, you'll also find my notes from today's show and the action items I took away from our conversation. Until next week, keep rocking and go conquer the world. views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help architects conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5. Do it anyway.